Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Joshua chapter 8, beginning in verse 10. Joshua started early the next morning and mobilized them. Then he and the elders of Israel led the people up to Ai. All the troops who were with him went up and approached the city, arriving opposite Ai and camped to the north of it, with a valley between them and the city. Now Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. The troops were stationed in this way, the main camp to the north of the city and its rear guard to the west of the city. And that night, Joshua went into the valley. Interesting note about the Hebrew uh, right here in verse 13, Joshua went into the valley. Uh, in the original Hebrew, there's only one letter difference between this phrase and uh, I think it's verse 9 right before this. Uh, that Joshua spent that night with the troops. <laughs> Just changed one Hebrew letter and it completely changes the structure. It's kind of a reiteration of, of verse 9. What it indicates is that, uh, man, Joshua is leading by example. All right? George Washington wasn't the first general to do this. He's right there with his troops. He's among them. He's put himself in the same vulnerability to which he's called other people. It's good leadership. When the king of Ai saw the Israelites, the men of the city hurried and went out early in the morning so that he and all his people could engage Israel in battle at a suitable place facing the Arabah. But he did not know that there was an ambush waiting for him behind the city. So uh, Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten back by them and fled toward the wilderness. Then all the troops of Ai were summoned to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city." Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel, leaving the city exposed while they pursued Israel. So you can observe here the vulnerability of the enemy who has overplayed the hand. They thought that the people of God were going to do the exact same thing they had done before. They fall for the ruse. They start to pursue them. And in their hubris, there's not a single general among them who's like, hang on, time out, wait a second, which indicates a lot of pride on their part because this is these are poor uh, these are poor battle tactics. There's something I want to show you that's, that exposes a parallel between this conquest of AI and then the modern day believer in the culture wars. Right? In Acts chapter 19, uh, there's, there's this guy named Demetrius. He makes idols for Artemis, this, this pagan goddess that everybody he claims that throughout Asia worships. Um, there have been a lot of people repenting from pagan practices. 50 or was it 30,000 pieces of silver worth of, uh, you know, pagan like magical books had been burned because these people were repenting and they're following the one true God now. And this was disruptive to the business. Demetrius, who clearly has a financial motive in all this, has come out and, and is utterly aghast. He's completely shocked at this teaching from Paul and everybody saying that gods aren't made by hands. Uh, that should be obvious, but this is, uh, th this is inflammatory uh, to Demetrius because it gets into his pocketbook. He doesn't want these people saved. He wants them buying his idols. And so, man, as a representative, I think of the devil, like he just, uh, he, he, he incites a riot against them. So here's, here's Acts chapter 19, verse 26. This is Demetrius speaking. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. <laughs> all right, um, let's be clear. They're not. Okay, if you make something up and worship it, you're committing idolatry. If you make up your own morality and you abide by it, you've made yourself God. Right? It's true. Paul's right. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. The very one all of Asia and the world worship. Okay, uh, this is not true. All right, I can, <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. Uh, I lived in Nashville and there is like this replica um, there, uh, there, there is this, the statue of Artemis, uh, there in, in Midtown Nashville, not too far actually from, from, uh, what was then, I think St. Luke's hospital where Autumn Grace was born. 
And it was kind of funny, uh, after Jesse had given birth and everything, and she was really hungry and, uh, it's Valentine's day. And so we couldn't go on a Valentine's date and she was very hungry and she picked out all sorts of food from like, uh, you know, PF Chang's and Krispy Kreme and everything. And so I made my rounds around midtown Nashville, driving around this statue of Artemis (laughs) to get the menu for our date night right there in the hospital, uh, with a little tiny baby girl. Uh, right there with us the the day that she was born. And somehow, oddly, all of this happened in proximity to Artemis. But I can tell you firsthand, having driven around, having seen it, actually having officiated a wedding uh, in the park nearby, that um, people aren't going there to worship Artemis. It's a tourist attraction. It's a spectacle. That's all it is. Verse 28, when they heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. So some of Paul's entourage, Gaius and Aristarchus, they're getting dragged into it. And Paul actually wants to willingly go, but then his team is like, no, Paul, stay back. Don't get in this. (laughs) Paul had a knack for just stepping right into the line of fire fearlessly. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Dude, this is, this is a riot. This still happens today. This still happens today. When you see a massive riot and you go to those man on the street interviews and you just get these, you know, like anecdotal quick video testimonials from people who are there like, what are we doing here? And they're like, I don't know. It's a crowd. And I came and I joined in. So they're, they're subject to the mob mentality. This herd instinct takes over and people in mass numbers do a lot of stupid things. And this is this is what's happening in this riot in the amphitheater. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front. Motioning with his hand, Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. These people thought that they were victorious, much like the people in the military of AI. Just wait, just watch, see. The people of the city of AI actually had on their side a previous victory. They had conquered Israel before. They didn't know why. They took credit for it. They didn't know that actually God is the one who sabotaged his own people and gave them those first 36 casualties that they'd ever experienced in this generation of Israel. And these worshipers of Artemis, some of whom really weren't worshipers of Artemis at all, they just had financial interests in mind. Man, when you come between like, you know, idol makers and their money, man, they get really mad, they get really hostile, and uh, things got really, really scary for a minute. But the, the crowd really massively outnumbered Paul and company. You had Aristarchus, uh, you had you had Alexander, you had Paul, uh, but man, this massive crowd of people is all just shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Why are we here? What are we doing? Okay, that's it. We're worshiping Artemis. Got it. And it looked like Christianity was losing. Okay, in that moment, at that riot, Christianity was massively, colossally outnumbered. And uh, at this point, it was considered uh, the way, like followers of the way. And, and so we looked really, really outnumbered back then. And, and the, the side against God was massive and, and thought that it was victorious. Don't be discouraged, Christian, as the lostness of culture can seem overwhelming. It very well may be that, you know, it's God's will that those around us who live in, in cities like the one that we do here near Seattle, that we have been marked for, for an outpouring of God's wrath. But the reason that we're here is that we're hoping God brings revival instead. And we may be massively outnumbered, but we are in no way outmatched. This is proving ground for Christianity. Christianity has always thrived in settings like these. In fact, it is growing and thriving in more hostile conditions around the world right now. Just ask your brothers and sisters in the underground church in China. 